Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please rise and join me as we sing before all the saints. from the book of Ruth, some selected readings from chapter 3 and 4. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me, I will do. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall, he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Now Naomi took the child, laid him in her bosom, and became his nurse. 
The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As we continue to think about the saints this morning, let's sing together, Seek Ye First. Friends, today is the first Sunday of the month. It's also All Saints Day. We'll be celebrating Holy Communion today and also celebrating the saints. We'll do that in just a little bit. In the United Methodist Church, everyone is invited to come to the table. The only thing we ask is that you answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all that love him, who earnestly re repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not heard the cry of our neighbors. Love our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's always a special time for me to celebrate All Saints Day. We'll begin today with the reading from the Gospel, which is in the Gospel of Mark. It's chapter 12. As you're able, would you please stand? As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of banquets. They devour widows' houses for the sake of the appearance and say long prayers. They will receive the great commendation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those contributing to the treasury. For all of them contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. <clears throat> So we started off today with the story of Ruth. And actually there's another scripture that comes from 1 Kings. It is a story about Elijah that fits into this same thing. Elijah's traveling through an area and he comes to a place. God has sent him there. And, and uh, God says, go to this woman that you find and have her prepare food for you. And he goes and he says, ma'am, I need you to fix me some food and out of some meal and some oil. And, she says, I've just got a tall, tiny morsel left. And, and as soon as I fix that for my son and I, we're going to die. And Elijah says, oh, no, 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 no. Go and fix me some first, and then you eat what's good for the kids. And then the story goes that there was plenty from then on. And I think these stories fit together in a way where the, here we know, most of you know the story of Ruth. Ruth is in a foreign land. Her husband dies, her brother-in-law dies, her father-in-law dies. In those days, women have no rights to own anything. Naomi says, y'all go back and be with your, your families, and, and one of the daughters does, but Ruth says, no, where you go, I will go. And so they go back to their homeland, 
And it's evident to Naomi quickly that they need to do something. And so the story's a lot longer than I read today, but essentially what happens is she hooks her up with Boaz. Boaz then marries her, Ruth, and then they have a child, and Naomi then becomes the nursemaid to the child. Out of nothing, out of just no hope, comes hope. And then we get to this part in Mark where we, we find out that this woman that gives two coins that are worth a penny together has given more than all of the people that give out of their abundance. And friends, I, I got to tell you, these lessons fit, to well, fit together so well. The woman and her son think they're going to die. They have nothing left. Ruth has no future at all, but Naomi manages to figure out a way to get them a future. And then we conclude the story with this woman who gives everything she has to the treasury for God. I grew up for years as a commissioned salesperson thinking that uh, when the church would come around and they'd say things like, we'd really like you to fill out a pledge card. They used to call them that. We call them estimate of giving now, but we used to call them a pledge card and they'd come around, they'd ask me to fill one out and I'd say, well, if I knew how much money I was going to make, I would fill out a pledge card. But since I don't know how much money I'm going to make, I can't fill one out. It was a good excuse, lasted for probably 20 years. And then one day, after Kathy and I were married and we began to develop friendships out of the church, we listened, I guess, more carefully. And we said to our, and maybe we're just in a different place so we could hear it. And we said to each other, you know, we could do something. Now, we don't know how we could do. We've never done this before. We're a new married couple. We don't know what we can really accomplish. And we made a pledge. If I remember correctly, it was $15 a week. And we thought to ourselves, I don't know if we can even do that. Well, at the end of the year, we didn't notice the $15 a week being gone. A lot of other stuff happened during that time. And it became evident to us that following God first made our marriage stronger, made our friendships better, made our life more complete. And so we just decided, well, if we could do $15, we probably could do 30. And then the next year we decided to double it again. And, and we just found out we can't outgive God. I know I've told this before, but I accomplished seminary, which is about $45,000 worth of going with no debt. Kathy accomplished her bachelor's degree with Letourneau, which is not a cheap place to go to school. She did it with no debt. And in meanwhile, we had continued to realize that we've got to be like the, the widow, if you will, and we've got to put God first. We've got to give to God. If we do that, God will provide. My friend, uh, Ken Werlein, is a pastor at Faith Bridge United Methodist Church up in Spring. And uh, so one year he decided to do a thing with their church. He said, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to become a tithing church. Everybody's going to give 10%. And I'm sure everybody didn't, but some people did. And he went and, and they he said, we're going to do it for 90 days. And if at the end of 90 days, if you want your money back, we'll give it back. You will receive a blessing, but I can't assure you that it'll be monetary. You understand the difference there. And so what was interesting was that the 91st day, he went into the treasurer at the church and he said, we've got a lot of collections uh, don't spend any of it. They may want some back. <laughs> Last time I talked to Ken, it had been eight years. Nobody ever asked for anything back. It dramatically changed the way they were able to buy the 75 acres where their church is now and other things because the people stepped up to do the things that were required of the church. I never understood for a long time what this scripture meant when it said those people give a lot out of their abundance. I usually use the word extravagance. You know, it's that extravagant giving. We all hear that. We watch the TV, right, when they need money for the dog, the poor little dogs that are in their cages, you know, or, or, or those kids that are at St. Jude's Hospital, and we say, you know, if I just had more, I'd give more. And the reality is that those kids, St. Jude's Hospital does what it does. You'll notice they never, hardly ever, ask you really for money. What they say is you can take little Johnny who has leukemia and is near death and because of the treatment where no family has to spend a nickel 
Because of the treatment, we have little Johnny swinging on a swing set or playing at the end of the deal. Years ago, I was at a seminar for New Church Stark Preachers, and uh, there was a guy there that was talking to us about financial support. And you know, if you give money to the Salvation Army, or if you give money to the Goodwill people, typically you're going to receive a thank you note. And churches are the world's worst at not saying thank you. It's one of the reasons we're going to have a dinner, is to say thank you. The church is going to pay for it, we're going to do it, and we're going to gather together and eat to say thank you for being a supporter of this church. But they went through the newspaper and they found this place, this guy had given a million dollars to the Boys and Girls Club. And he was a member of the church. So they went to see him and they said, hey, would you consider a gift like that for the church? And he said, absolutely not. Y'all wouldn't know what to do with it. He said, what do you mean? He said, that Boys and Girls Club took little Ralph, who had no family. He was a, a, an orphan. He was a CPS kid. And they turned him into a high school graduate and a college attender. You show me that you're doing that with your money, and I'll be glad to give. I think more than ever, we live in a time like that right now. People are really not interested in big, tall, fancy church buildings. What they're interested in is what's the church doing? We experienced that in the pumpkin patch this year. We finished up, I think we, we, we netted about 900 bucks. And if you look at that, friends, you say, well, man, you were out there for 21 days from can to cane for $900. You know, that's not a lot of money. But you had to be there to have the people driving up in the community and say, thank God you're back with pumpkins again. Thank God we have a place to bring our kids to take pictures. That there's more monetary, more than monetary value in being a part of the community. And I think it just continues to prove it with our blessing box out there, the way that people continue to use it, people continue to be fed, and they realize that that's happening because of Hope Methodist Church. I don't give enough to it. I know I don't. I bring some food every now and then, but I am I do a labor of love. I fill the box a lot when there's other food out there. But I need to do better at that. And you look at the hall and you say, well, we have plenty right now. Well, we do, but you know what? We've got a holiday time coming. We had cold weather a little bit. There's a lot of people that need help. You're aware of that. There's a lot of people in our community that need help, amen? Amen. And, and right now, who knows why? I mean, you can blame anything you want to. You can blame the politicians. You can blame COVID. You can blame the, the, the lack of truck drivers, which I think is a significant cause. Let me tell you, I have to hunt to find grape juice right now for communion. And it doesn't come from China. It comes from Mr. Welch, wherever he's at. But it's, they don't have trucks to bring the stuff. You go, if you, uh, Kathy and I were at Kroger, I guess yesterday, and there's a lot of empty shelves. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you wonder, you know, how are we going to get through this? Well, we're going to get through it one day at a time, one episode of life at a time, and we're going to start to call on the memory of those that got through it before us. Let me tell you, we're going to celebrate some lives today of people that were in their 90s. They lived through more kind of stuff than we could imagine. People born in, the, in 1920, 1919, 1920, 1921, you realize they didn't have the internet then. <laughs> you know, you realize they didn't have very good cars then. They didn't have, even our crumbling highways are better than the highways they had. My daddy was born in Texline, Texas. If you've never been there, it's just on the edge of nowhere. If you go to Amarillo and you go north to Dumas and turn left, when you get to the state line, there's a bleep in the road, and that's called text line. He left there, him and his family, in a Model T in 1920 to come back to Somerville. It's a long drive in a nice modern car with comfortable air conditioning and good roads. I can't imagine that kind of a trip with a whole family in a Model T. And a Model A is a lot fancier than a Model T, let me just tell you. You know, we, we, we have so much to be thankful for. And, and somebody in 1937 started a church on this corner. It was called Hope Community. I don't know. It was called Golden Acres Community Church. It wasn't Methodist at the time. It was just a community church. Somebody had a dream that there was a church needed on this corner. 
And, and they had no concept of what it would look like in, 19, in 2021. They couldn't have. How would they know? <clears throat> what I know, because uh, there's, a, there's a guy that used to live across the street in what's now our vacant lot across the street. They had a neon cross. It was purple. And it was on the top of a much taller bell tower than the one we have now. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> Lloyd told me, he said, at night I would wake up and that darn purple cross was flashing in the light through the window of my bedroom. Somebody thought this place ought to be a beacon of hope and prayer and thought in this community. And over the years, it got moved around. There was a wooden building over there in front of what's the, now the education wing. That wooden building had a dirt floor. Sometime later, I don't know exactly what year, they moved it right over here by this crepe myrtle plant that's out here in the front. That crepe myrtle plant's been there all this time. And they, they put it over there and they put a floor in it. It was a little fancier. Some of y'all, I know Rodney remembers it, Harry does, but there was a building there where they used it for Sunday school and other stuff like that. 1957, they built this building. It didn't go down the hall. It ended at that door over there by the coffee pot. The men's room was there, the ladies' room was where it is now, and the children's nursery was in that little spot we now call the bride's room. That was it. That was the building in 1957. This is a pretty stupendous building to have built, been built at that time. It, it, I don't know what they paid. I do know they sold church bonds, because I have somewhere in there in the office the list of all the people that contributed to buying church bonds, and it was about, uh, it, it was a big deal. This is not a... a, a um, a veneer building. This is an actual brick building. Uh, it saves us a lot of money on insurance. Had a slate roof at that time. Uh, you know, it was just a very different place. It was a pretty stupendous building for this neighborhood. And it's still beautiful today. I don't think we've detracted from the beauty at all. The changes we made, we just made it more friendly. Things have changed a little bit over the years. I know that the neighborhood developer that developed Golden Acres left a place for the Baptist Church down the street as well. And the two main entrances into Golden Acres on Lily and on Pansy both had a church as you entered into the Golden Acres community. Y'all know, many of you don't know how isolated this community was in those days. It was really a community, had its own post office, they had a little grocery store up here by Spencer, uh, they moved us up. It was its own little place. People that grew up here have a particular camaraderie. It's, uh, it's interesting to find them when you run into them. They're, they're, uh, they're just Golden Acres kids. And they were nice enough to hang out with some of us that lived across Preston, but they had their own clique and their own community. And lots of these people I went to high school with. It's just it's amazing to know how they were. I can't imagine the sacrifices that people made to build this building. And I can tell you that we stand on their shoulders as we provide ministry today. Even though we provide ministries they would have never thought of, we couldn't be here if they wouldn't have been. We have to have them in our history. Today as we gather to remember the saints, we reach that time in our, in our church life where we start to realize that all of us have someone whose shoulders we stand on in our faith journey. Some of us were lucky enough to have parents that drug us to church, heels kicking and screaming down the hallway. Some of us came by choice because there were other kids and fun people. I used to, when I was at the other church, we had a great big, uh, for a while, we had a big youth group, and I used to tell them, that if you could just get the cheerleaders, you know, the, the male and the female cheerleaders, you can have a big youth group, because if there's a couple of really cool kids, the rest of the kids will come. Uh, you know, we live in such a different time now it, 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 where we've got five high schools in our area. People travel in a diverse way. And you can't do church the way we did it 50 years ago. Bishop Jones regularly says, all of our church buildings are built in case the 50s ever come back. But they're not. And we have to face that. We have new things we have to do, new ways to reach out. And we have to do things that don't necessarily repay us with money or members. Our giving should be done like this widow woman because that's what we do, not because we expect to get something in return. It's a mindset that has to change. And in the old days, and when I still run into those older preachers than me, the ones that have been doing it for 50 years, the first thing they'll always ask me is, how big is your church? How many members do you have? And I'm a lot more interested to tell them how much we give away than I am how many members we have. 
Do you all realize that over the last 10 years with the Bill Nash effort, we've given somewhere around $40,000 away? Amen. That, that we have continued to do Angel Tree. The Angel Tree names are in. We'll be doing that this year. These are kids who have parents that are incarcerated. We've done that every year since I've been here, since 2008. We reach out and we provide for people that have no hope, that have no future, that don't know what it's about. They have not heard these words, some of them. They've never known who Jesus Christ is or what a difference it might make to have Him a part of their life. Now they know what good is, and they have some concept of righteousness. They don't necessarily connect those to Jesus. That's our task. That's what God calls us to do, is to be ministers of the gospel. If you've been baptized, it doesn't matter if you were baptized Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ. If you've been baptized, you now have the authority to go out and minister to the gospel. Maybe not by reading scriptures, but by living a life that exemplifies the life of Christ. What did Christ do when he ran into people that didn't like him? Did he sit there and he sometimes he gave to ask them questions that made them feel a little dumb? But he didn't go in and antagonize or do anything else. He just simply loved them. And I think we have to find a way at this time, especially this time, to love people that we don't know, that we don't necessarily see as lovable. And we need to quit relying on the world to fix it because the world can't. There's a permanent disconnect between the spiritual realm and the way the world goes. And I'm telling you, it's permanent. It happened in Jesus' time. It's happening right now. And you have to choose. You're going to follow the world. I can tell you it's, it's tempting. Oh, if you'll just take this job or if you'll move to this place or if you'll get this bigger house, your life will be great. Let me tell you, there's a huge difference in having what you want and what you need. And for the most of us, it's easy for us to understand we have what we need. And anything more than that is extravagance. And it's out of that that we should feel a little bit guilty. Thanksgiving's coming. One of my dreams is, is uh, Ray down here at Denim Meat Company. And we have this dream. We're, we're going to make this happen maybe one day. But we'd like to put a big tent over here on our vacant lot. And we'd like to feed people Thanksgiving dinner for free in this community. Now, that's a big undertaking. It's not going to happen just from this church. It's going to have to be a community-wide effort. And we haven't got there yet. But that doesn't mean we should quit dreaming about it. This last week, I received notice from my police chief, Lynn Limmer. Uh, the letter I got from him started off with, I couldn't leave without saying farewell. Chief Limmer's 86 years old. He came down with COVID. He spent 17 days in ICU. He went out and went to rehab, like so many. When he went for his recheck the other day with the doctor, the doctor advised him he had contracted something called pulmonary fibrosis, and that it was terminal. Now, I don't know what you'd do if you got that news. I'm not sure what I would do if I got that news, but let me tell you what he did. He sent a letter to all of us and told us how much we meant to him. And then he reached out to anybody that had, he had hurt over the years and asked for forgiveness. And then to make it a step further, he said, let me also forgive those who have hurt me. He said, because, friends, he said, I'm applying for the job of guardian angel. Hmm. And he said, in that application, I'm sure it'll be, this is because this is a cop talk, and he said, I'm sure it'll be a long interview process with an oral review board at the end. <laughs> and he said, what I would appreciate is if they call you as a reference, and you can, say something nice. Because I really want the job. He said, I think I've been given the gift of time to make amends where I can, to ask for forgiveness where I can, to forgive others where I can. But he said, I know the time is coming, and then when that time comes, I hope I'm accepted with open arms. And he said, I can assure you that when you feel the right hand of God on your shoulder in troubled times, my hand as your guardian angel will be on your left shoulder. Hmm. That's a person 
who knows where he's going. Amen. And he knows where he's been. I was very emotional. I had the privilege three years ago to sit with Lynn Lemmer and Marty, his wife, at one of our re 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 reunion dinners. He had a great sense of humor. I never saw that when he was the chief. <laughs> now that I work for him, I got to see a sense of humor. He was married in the Catholic Church many years ago. Of course, he was not Catholic. Marty was. They decided to renew their vows after 50 years, so they went up to the priest and said, it's a different priest, same church, said, we'd like to renew our vows. And Lynn said, well, you know, I know I'm not Catholic, so we won't be able to stand on the center aisle. We have to stand off to the side because I'm not Catholic. And the priest said, nope, nope, we've changed all that. He said, I know when we invite all the women to come, they're going to have to have their head covered and all that stuff. He said, no, no, we changed that. He said, oh, I guess you'll be serving me communion too. He said, no, we didn't change that. <laughs> A gentle soul, 47 years in law enforcement, 27 of it with the group I worked with. I only worked for him for four years, but working for that man changed my life. When we talk about the saints, when we talk about the people that these stories are written about, whether it's Elijah, who lived a life that was so exemplary that Elisha wanted the same life, when we talk about somebody like Ruth that was so helpless and hopeless, not because of her own being, because of the way the world was, they had nowhere to go. And an enterprising woman, Naomi, figures out a way. Because of Ruth's faithfulness to go where she went to set them up, where once again, they were secure and safe. So many times when we talk about this kind of stuff at the church, you look and you say, well, I don't know that I can do anything or anything more than I do. I want to tell you, friends, you don't even begin to know what you can do until you let God know what you want to do. And I think that's the effort that we have to make. And, and as we stay in a few minutes, when I ask you to stand and we call out these names, you're going to remember some things about them. I may say some things about them. These are people that absolutely changed the DNA of this church. Some of them. One in particular. I miss him. I miss all these people. But one in particular, his name was John Bremner. John Bremner was a, a slight guy. He lived over on Young Street at Fairmont, about 4.1 miles from here. He came every Saturday night that I can think of with very few exceptions for seven or eight years. He always walked. It didn't matter if it was 100 degrees. He would get here an hour early so he'd be less sweaty by the time church started. If it was pouring out rain, he'd come in his yellow slicker. If it was cold, he'd be wearing his Dallas Cowboys leather jacket. You know why I like John. <laughs> I asked him one time, I said, John, you've got a church across the street. And I think he went there some. But I said, why do you come over here? He said, because you serve communion here every week on Saturday night. Because this church treats me different. John was very quiet when he first came. About two years into him coming, we started a Bible study down at Pine Tree Lodge. Every Thursday night, we'd meet with some people and read the Bible like we do in our men's Bible study now. We're just reading the Bible. John would leave. It would take him about four hours altogether by the time he left where he was to show up over here to be with us. He never one time would accept a ride home. In fact, the only time I ever knew him to accept a ride home was from another saint that we're going to share her life in just a minute. That's Lillian Eason. Lillian was driving along. Stephen was there. He was driving the truck and they saw John walking. I don't know if it was raining or cold or hot. I don't know. And, and you know, Lillian, if you knew Lillian, she's a force. <laughs> she could be a real force she wasn't, barely could see out of the window of the truck she rolled that window down and she said John you get in this truck we're taking you home and he got in <laughs> you see that's the kind of stuff do you, do you wonder about somebody's place in the kingdom when they have that kind of heart 
when they have the kind of faithfulness that John had to come to church, how many of us would prepare for three hours early to get somewhere we want to go and walk there? We find better excuses than that. Well, it's a little cold. It's a little rainy. I slept late. Y'all, you know, you know my rule is you're never late. <laughs> you can hear when we say amen, you were still here. Sometimes we look at things and we say, I just can't do it. I'm reminded of the guy that broke down up in East Texas out in the woods. It was dark. Some of you heard this story. Some of you probably even told it. It was dark. It gets dark in East Texas. They don't have street lights. They got big tall pine trees. They block out the moon, the stars, and everything else. He got out to change his flat and realized they didn't have a lug wrench. You ever been there? I've been there. One time I had a lug wrench, but it was for a Chevrolet and I was driving a Ford. It wouldn't fit. He says, well, I did see a house a couple of miles back. I think I'll walk back and see if they've got a lug wrench. So he takes off walking. And he starts to think to himself, he says, you know, that guy's probably not going to have a lug wrench either. If he does, it probably won't fit my car. Two miles of this, walking along, finally he sees the light. It's dark everywhere else. There's one little light on in this house. He goes up, walks up on the wooden step porch, stands on the door, opens the door, knocks on the door. The guy comes to the door and he looks at him. He says, I didn't want to borrow your darn wrench anyway. And he turns around and walks up. <laughs> That's the way we live sometimes. We, in our own mind, decide what the outcome's going to be. One of the biggest problems, those of us that have been in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, is we always wanted to plan the outcomes. We want to know what's going to happen before we do it. Let me tell you, friends, when you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know what you're going to do, and you don't know who you're going to be hanging out with. Who did Jesus hang with? It wasn't the rich guys. It was the hurting people. The ones that were called demoniac, remember? Or lepers. It was those guys Jesus hung with. And we wonder sometimes why the Christian community is not growing. Let me tell you, friends, there's, I don't know the number exactly, 2.3 billion Christians in the world. If we could just get past our denominational boundaries of how deep the baptismal water is or whether we kneel or stand or sing or chant, if we could just get past that, do you realize we have enough people to change the world? And all of it in the name of Jesus Christ. The problem is, of course, we're human. We want to change it our way. I want it to be the way I want it to be, not the way God wants it to be. As we mention these saints today, without any question, what I remember about all of these people is their selflessness, their resilience. Tom Elmer. At 93 years old, he wasn't a big guy. At 93 years old, he could stand there and keep his knees straight and put his palms flat on the ground. Jeez. Spend over like that. I'm not 93. I can't do that. What I know, friends, is that as we begin to think about what the new church, what, what the new world is going to look like, what post-COVID everything is going to be, Jesus Christ has an important role to play. And let's don't put him on the side. Let's put him at the center. Let's put our goals to follow Jesus into the future, not take Jesus with us, kicking and screaming into the world we want. And I can assure you if we do, I'll be kind of like Ken Werlein. In 90 days, if you start to live that way, if you put God first, if you start to put Jesus first, you serve the church in every way you can, you do all those other things along with it, I believe you'll be blessed. And I think you'll feel the blessing in ways you never expected. I want to talk about these people now. If you're willing and able, would you stand as we mention these names? I want to start with Frederick J. Dunham. We knew him as Jay. Sweet guy. Over in the fellowship hall, I have his hat that he read to the kids in the pumpkin patch with Farmer Fred. A patriot. 
a person that served his country, and a person that was willing to serve faithfully in his church and his community. Drafted people to go and be a part of Christmas celebrations in June. He was doing everything he could to change the world. And I think he did. Tom Griffin. Many of you didn't get to know Tom. I didn't know him well, but I certainly knew him. One of the things I could say about Tom was sometimes he was a hoot. <laughs> I think a lot of the times he was a hoot to cover up his sadness because of his sickness. But he was faithful. Many, many times, I know, told AJ, just go on and do stuff. And she, like every other faithful person, wanted to be with him as much as she could. But his heart was good. He was a good person. <laughs> Lily Neeson. Gosh, I, I, I could talk for an hour about Lillian. She had a school teacher background. She was not very tall. She had gray hair. She reminded me of my mother in so many ways. She was old school. My mother was too. She didn't understand some things about the way things work now. But I'll guarantee you that Children's University over there in Pasadena off of Strawberry has probably kept more kids, more, more people that you know as children than anybody else. 50 years, I remember when she celebrated 50 years. We would take the Easter eggs over there to Lillian on, at, or around Good Friday sometime to the kids over there, and, and she would have no part of us going in there and dumping the eggs and leaving. We had to sit down and eat. It might have been deviled eggs, it might have been that's the old school. You, you, you couldn't go see her. She wasn't going to give you something or feed you. She was going to take care of you. We miss her, but she is not gone. And she still lives with us today in the stuff we do, in the places we go. And thank God we still have Stephen with us to share those stories. The same week that we lost Lillian, we lost James Larson. James was a classmate of mine. We weren't that close in high school, but we had many, many mutual friends that kept us close over the years. The last time we saw him was the day we got rid of the pews here. And, and once again, I don't think he knew what he was going to do with them all, but he was just trying to help out to take care of things. And he, he leaves uh, a legacy. Many of the desks and other things we have in the church showed up because of Jim Larson. Keith Burgess used to sit right here by Jeannie. When you, every time you go in and out of the church, either at the fellowship hall or over here, you see a bench out there by the door. That's because Keith brought it up here to us and said, hey, somebody's getting rid of this. Do y'all want it? It was great. It replaced something we had out there that wasn't so good. It's been great. We, every, so Keith has implanted himself every time you go in or out. That door down there we see Keith. I told you about Tom, Tom Elmer. But let me tell you this about Tom. He was kind of like, he was kind of like uh, John Brimner. Uh, I've known Tom now for many years. Uh, Tom was diagnosed with cancer three times. They told him he'd never recover. He didn't die from cancer. He was preparing to come to church one Sunday and he fell backwards in the bathroom and hit his head on the toilet seat and broke his neck. Mm -hmm. Walked into the emergency room. And he just happened to, that, that day that Dr. Poxabon was there. And Dr. Poxabon went over and said, Mr. Elmer, we're fixing to take you for surgery so we can fix you up. And he said, well, we, you know what Tom is we got to talk about that. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, we can talk about it if you want, but if you ever want to walk again, you need to go now. If you ever ask Tom what kind of a day it was, it's a great day. John Brimner I've already talked a lot about John but sets an example for me I miss him terribly and we were not close friends but I miss him on Saturday nights he was just always here 
None of y'all, well, some of you did get to meet Ruth Hanks. Ruth was, uh, is Margaret Sandlin's mama. She was 90-something. Uh, COVID was really not nice to her because she lived in a nursing home, and when they shut the visitation down, nobody could go and see her. She was already losing her memory, and so it was just really tough on her and everybody else. And then just lost recently, just the other day, uh, Ron has an extended family that he only fairly recently met. Melba Thornhill was Ron Baker's half-sister. I guess half, right? Uh, Ron said, well, you know, she was probably assembly of God. I said, well, that's okay. It's all the same kingdom. It's all the same place. These are names that we remember. As we remember those names and stories, let us pray. Gracious God, we come today and stand here with the saints. Oh, I know they're with you and not with us, but we're together. And in a few minutes, we will come to your table where they will join us as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Let us not forget that they have gone ahead of us and that we will see them again. And it is the joy of the communion of saints that gives us hope. Gracious God, help us to remember. Help us to tell the stories. Help us to live the lives that have been handed to us by these great saints of our church. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Many years ago, long time ago now, 20 years ago, to about almost 20, 2003, my mother died and we took her casket down to First Methodist Church in Houston, where she was a member. And it was there in the front of the church. It was in February might have been March because she died right at the end of February. In a few months, few few months later, I had the opportunity to be commissioned as an elder in the United Methodist Church in that same church, at that same altar, literally about three feet from where my mom's casket was. What an honor it was to be able to have my mom present because I know she's at the altar of the saints. Amen. When we come to this table, friends, everybody that helped us be where we are today is there. If they died in Christ, they're at the table and they're beckoning us to come. And they're handing us the mantle like, a, like Elijah did to Elijah saying, go out and do what I've done. And like Jesus who looked out at the people and said, you will do even greater things than I've done. Do you believe that? We have more resources, more communication, better facilities. Yes, we can do great things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I know I don't have it on the uh, agenda today, but uh, we're going to do it anyway, and we're just going to be running over, so you just have to get over it. Uh, <laughs> as you're able, would you please stand? Take a few minutes and offer signs of reconciliation and peace to each other here in this building as we celebrate these great saints. <laughs>
be with you. And also with you. Oh, let me give Johnny time to catch up. <clears throat> Today's special offering goes for United Methodist students. Uh, I was a recipient of some of that when I went to seminary. It's part of the reason I got through seminary with no debt. And so uh, any nickels, dimes, and quarters you have are appreciated for that in the bucket. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our, our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God. You are the creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God of Miriam and Moses, the God of Joshua and Deborah, Ruth and David, the God of the priests and the prophets, Mary and Joseph, the apostles and the martyrs, our mothers and our fathers, the God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn together. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Do this. Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is dying. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we have named before you today. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to the all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever in the church said. Amen. Amen. Friends, the table is prepared. You're invited to come. Come to this place where heaven and earth meet. Come, the saints call you to the table.
everyone been served? I learned to ask. Sometimes I forget. Friends, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. We've only begun to understand what God has in store for us. But I can tell you, he has a lot for us to do. I'm so grateful that you're with us today. Thank you for helping us to celebrate these great saints. Let's join together now as we sing our closing hymn, which is Freely, Freely, We Have Received. As you're able, would you please stand? Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Have a good week. Brian, you may have seen another. I'll do that.